Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Surfshark VPN. Tune until the end to find out about their amazing service. Gotta be honest, you guys, I was joking about my obsessive desire to analyze Over the Hedge these past few months. Truth be told, this is a movie that I never really had a ton to say about. I just really liked it as a kid, and that was about it. And as an adult, I still think it's pretty good. It's not deceptively amazing like Megamind, or a true cinematic masterpiece gifted to us by the gods like Shrek 2. It's just a pretty good movie that I like. And that's a decent accomplishment, because a lot of shit from my childhood, whether I liked it or not back then, does not hold up today by any standards. So Over the Hedge should honestly be proud of being a merely good movie. So yeah, don't bother buckling your seatbelts for this analysis, because it's not really an analysis at all. Just a nice, laid-back review of why I enjoy Over the Hedge and why all you haters can't stop me. For the uninitiated, Over the Hedge came out in 2006 and was inexplicably not nominated for the Academy Award for Best Animated Feature, despite being far better than every single one of the nominees that year. I mean, maybe. I haven't seen Monster House in a while. Yeah, this is one of those DreamWorks movies that just kind of came and went. It did fine critically, fine financially, and audiences seemed to like it just fine. It wasn't fine enough for an Oscar nomination, unlike these apparent cinematic masterpieces. <laughs> And its box office wasn't fine enough for a sequel, according to Jeffrey Katzenballs, which is honestly a darn shame. I would have loved to see more of these characters, especially since Madagascar got all this. Since Madagascar 2 was even funnier than the original, I think an Over the Hedge 2 could have gone in the same direction. This is just a fun, enjoyable movie that I would have loved to see more of. Way better than Madagascar 1, anyway. You maniac! But that's enough beating around the bush. Get it? Bush, that is a synonym for hedge. Haha, <laughs> hilarious joke. Okay, video time. <laughs> Comedy is subjective, and not everyone will find this movie funny and all that, whatever. But I do, damn it! Okay, sometimes Hammy burps, and I hate that, just like any sensible human being, but that's about it. I think some of the jokes in this movie are actually pretty well-written and enjoyable. The movie takes some really fun slights at everything, from the absurdity of hyper-consumerism and the perils of an ultra-capitalist society, to the THX logo. A lot of the humor in this movie is just so over-the-top and absurd that it slays me. I love the recurring gag of stuff being able to be seen from space. It was funny the first time with the chips, since the animals are experiencing this amazing new sensation for the first time, and it was funny with the sky beam at the end. They build on the joke by showing it from Earth, then from the galaxy. That's just good callback comedy, plain and simple. Oh, wait a minute. I'm just now being informed that this first joke is in fact... <laughs> because it doesn't have any misery being spread. Comedy is apparently only funny when misery is being spread. I learned that from someone who spreads misery every single time he tries to be funny. Anyway, what really makes the comedy in this movie stand out is the vocal delivery. This cast is absolutely pitch perfect. With Bruce Willis being a surprisingly natural fit for a wisecracking raccoon, Steve Carell hamming it up as the squirrel whose name escapes me at this moment, William Shatner killing it as the possum who turns plain dead into the art form it desperately deserves to become, and Gary Shandling fitting a neurotic turtle insanely well. I have to say, it's really disappointing that many of these actors don't do a ton of voice roles in major animated movies. They all bring a ton to their characters here, and none of them are annoying or out of place. It's not like modern animated movies, which all star James Corden, who might be the most annoying human being on the planet. I really want to live in an alternate dimension where Gary Shanling is still alive and he voices every animated character in existence, while James Corden just works in a toll booth. But I guess at this point I'd settle for a dimension where I can go outside. What if we have a potential pandemic on our hands? Uh oh. But yeah, these voice actors turn the funny lines even funnier. Plus they even make the more simple and mundane dialogue surprisingly memorable. Look, people! Play with them. The great news is that, even though it's animated, you're still hearing Shatner and all the other actors, whose eccentric quirks really shine through in their vocal performances. If you're concerned that the jokes don't work because you're only hearing the actors and not seeing them, maybe that's a sign that you need to shut up and listen. And not only are the voice actors great, but the slapsticky action is an absolute blast. Both the wagon chase and the verminator truck bear battle chase epic battle of cosmic proportions are so damn fun to watch. 
Also, the pop culture references in this movie are actually pretty funny, mostly because they're pretty infrequent and not jammed down our throats, unlike some movies I know. Overall, I'd say that Vern, the Gary Shandling turtle, is my second favorite character. His neurotic tendencies and extreme caution make for some solid comedy, and I love his interactions with RJ the Bruce Willis raccoon, my third favorite character. Their relationship is somewhat akin to Woody and Buzz, with a de facto leader getting replaced by the cool new guy in town. But the characters are distinct enough in terms of personality and motivation to the point where it becomes its own thing. Oh wait a minute, you didn't listen to my last sentence at all, did you? You're wondering who my favorite character in the movie is. <laughs> Stay tuned. For now, let's talk about... PRESENTATION! <laughs> First things first, why is the soundtrack such fire? They got Ben Folds to record several original songs for this movie, and I honestly have no clue why. But they're great. I'm truly shocked by how enjoyable they are. They fit each scene really well, and I literally had heist stuck in my head for the last 14 years. Please help me. I want to be free of this pain. No, 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 no. Oh, no! Additionally, I think the animation holds up way better than it has any right to, particularly on the environments. The forest looks vibrant, suburbia looks enticing, the food makes me so hungry. The animation on the humans even looks pretty passable by modern standards. Pro tip, don't go back and rewatch B-Movie, you will vomit. <laughs> Yeah! One cool thing about this movie is that the humans are almost always shown to us from the perspective of the animals. It's pretty neat attention to detail. I love how the movie can also portray what's going on with the story or characters through imaginary logos, like when RJ is hyperventilating into a bag of oh no's. Little details like that just make this movie feel so vibrant and fun. And of course, we must discuss the scene that single-handedly changed cinema. Hammy's sped up adventure. The grandfather of the Quicksilver scenes and that scene from the Sonic movie. No, seriously, I'm not even joking about that. The director legit said that they took inspiration from Over the Hedge. I finally feel vindicated. Hammy's slowdown sequence is much simpler in its execution compared to all the moving pieces and its spiritual successors, but it has a nice peaceful charm to it. Honestly, it kind of blew my mind as a kid that a movie could play with time concepts quite like this. I just never had seen anything like it before. And it leads to one great finale where this, ahem, camo-colored chick hydrobot annihilates all three villains in one fell swoop. It's so damn good. Anyway, let's talk about something that many people consider to be not so good. Even though they are incorrect in their assessment, here is why. <laughs> Okay, so a ton of people tend to take issue with storylines that involve a character lying to the other characters for their own benefit, only to have the lie revealed, leading to a big emotional blowout, and eventually the liar comes back to save the day and all is forgiven. It's a popular staple of kids' movies, and DreamWorks in particular uses this trope way too often. But just because it's been done before doesn't mean you can't try it again and make it not suck. Think about it. What's the worst thing about this trope? The actual argument scene itself. This is why A Bug's Life is actually kinda bad, don't at me. Because it pours so much energy into this dumbass fight between Flick and the other ants, who berate him for bringing back circus bugs instead of warriors. But like, at this point, it doesn't matter what kind of bugs they are. Having them fight the grasshoppers off is not the plan. The giant fake bird is the plan. But no, we can't possibly use this giant fake bird anymore, because that plan came from a Ooh, liar. Yeah. Obviously, this means this pretty brilliant plan is also a lie, somehow. You see the problem? This movie is foregoing logic and common sense in favor of melodrama. This forced, irrelevant argument is pure melodrama, plain and simple. Over the Hedge, on the other hand, is regular drama. Hold the mellow. The argument and the banishing the liar bullshit is not the focus. The focus here is the aftermath of the betrayal. RJ escapes before the gang has a chance to berate him for lying, and the focus then shifts to the characters getting caught and lamenting the fact that they trusted him. This is followed by RJ lamenting the fact that he betrayed the only family he ever had. That's actually a well done, profoundly sad moment. This movie doesn't get nearly enough credit for taking a worn out trope like this and reworking it so that it actually works within the context of the story. And one of the best parts is that the anger the other characters feel towards RJ RJ is still there, it's just adapted into a hilarious manic action sequence where RJ is trying to get back into the van only to constantly get thrown back out. It's gold. None of the storyline is presented in a tedious manner, even if it is predictable. I even like a lot of the scenes earlier on where RJ is conflicted about his duplicitous scheme. Get real Kevin, cause when you feel like a dirtbag, it's because you're a dirtbag, right? So, so just own it. 
Just say it out loud, I am a dirt bag. It works even better since the animals do have a typical big blowout scene, but it's with Vern, the person who actually does have their best interests at heart, even if he said some mean things in the heat of the moment. I love movies that can say, yeah, some tropes suck. Here they are again, except actually good this time. So yeah, I think the dramatic stuff in this movie actually really works. It's not amazing or anything, there's nothing here that'll make you cry, but it's better than any emotional scene from the Madagascar trilogy, so yeah. Sorry I'm being so mean to Madagascar, y'all know I enjoy it, but this movie's just a lot better and more cohesive, I'm sorry. And if you don't believe me, then don't worry. I've saved the best for last. Put your fins together for the one, the only, the highness, flyingest, rootinest, tootinest character around. And his name is... This huge guy carrying the real character, Dwayne LaFontaine, aka the Verminator. <laughs> That's right, the Verminator gets his own segment. Any pretense of this video being a legitimate, thought-provoking analysis has just been verminated. The Verminator is my pride and joy. Every second this gleefully absurd exterminator is on screen, he absolutely steals the show. Brought to life with the impeccable vocal delivery of Thomas Hayden Church, best known as the villain of Spider-Man 3. No, the other one. No, the other one. No, the- Hey, speaking of Spider-Man 3, can we talk about the fact that Over the Hedge actually juggles three villains better than Spider-Man 3? <laughs> Vincent has his place in the story as RJ's motivation to get the food, and Gladys is the main human opposed to the animal shenanigans. Also, Gladys is pretty funny and a good antagonist, not gonna lie. This is exactly why I called the Exterminator, to kill them before they get hurt like this. But that's not important, because she doesn't have an associate's degree from Vermtech. Do you, in fact, have an associate's degree from Vermtech? Literally every Every single one of this man's lines is hilarious. I personally guarantee that there will not be a living thing at this party. Not only is the entire film enlivened and elevated when he comes on screen, but I don't even have a coherent thought to end the sentence with because I got distracted watching clips of him in the movie. He's just that captivating. He takes his job so insanely seriously, and his unique, exceptional brand of manic energy makes for one outstanding antagonist. Much like the greatest movie villains of all time, he's not in the movie for very long, but he makes the most of every single scene. Also, for some reason, I really like the way that he says, Get her! Right here at the end. The delivery honestly cracks me up. So yeah, this movie has the Verminator, and people still have the audacity to call it bad. What the hell is wrong with these people? Nothing. It's fine to dislike a movie as long as you agree that the Verminator is a gift from God himself. Because after all, it's only a movie. <laughs> Yeah, I really like Over the Hedge. However, opinions are valid, and I really don't care if you hate it. I don't care if you hate Megamind. I don't care if you like Shark Tale. Literally, I could care less. Just stick to your own opinions and let other people have theirs. With this movie, I'm not on some grand quest to show people its neglected worth, like with Shrek 4, or explain why it's a subversive masterpiece, like with Megamind. Wait a minute, it subverted the typical hallmarks of the Liar Revealed storyline, and the Verminator is a masterpiece of a character. Holy shit, this is a subversive masterpiece! Everybody bow down to your lord and savior, the esteemed and profoundly misunderstood over the head. As someone who isn't afraid to look at stuff from my childhood and say, yeah, I kinda hate this now. Trust me when I say that Over the Hedge really doesn't have this problem. It's a joy to revisit. I wouldn't call it one of my favorite movies or anything, and I wouldn't even say it's an amazing film, but it's certainly a good one. It's got solid emotional beats and comedy, vibrant animation, an excellent voice cast, well, what's not to like? If you're looking for a fun romp down memory lane, give this one a rewatch. I'd say it holds up pretty well. But, I'll be the first to admit, it's not the most nutritious thing in the world. It's a fun snack, but I think I'm ready for the main course. There's another mid-2000s animated movie about animals and how they interact with the food humans create. Something so rich and palatable and deceptively outstanding that it not only holds up as a film I loved as a child, but it stands tall as one of my all-time favorite films as an adult. And that movie is Ratatouille. I was gonna do a fake out joke there, but then I looked it up and Food Fight actually was not a mid-2000s movie, so the joke wouldn't work. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's Ratatouille. I'm gonna review Ratatouille next. Get excited. But first, 
A word from our sponsor, Surfshark VPN, an incredible product that encrypts your data and protects you online. Surfshark VPN allows you to access geo-restricted content, meaning you can trick your browser into thinking you're in another country, thus allowing you to access content you couldn't get otherwise. That way, you don't have to physically travel to another country to watch that country's exclusive Netflix content, for example. You can enjoy region lock content without having to go over any hedges. You can also use Surfshark and its hack lock system to get alerts anytime you're email address or password is compromised. Hacklock scans various databases of leaked information and notifies its users if their data is found so they can take action, which is an absolutely invaluable feature. Surfshark is also totally unlimited, meaning you can use it on as many devices as you like, even all at the same time. No other VPN allows this. Go to surfshark.deals Rillis and enter promo code Rillis to get 83% off and one extra month of Surfshark VPN for free. It's an amazing Amazing deal, and it's even better because it comes with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're not satisfied, you can cancel during those 30 days and get your money back. If you're looking for a great VPN, there's no reason not to give Surfshark a try. Once again, head to surfshark.deals Rillis and enter the promo code Rillis. Have a great time with Surfshark VPN. 